This conference will this conference will now be recorded. Hello, hello everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's uh, ACRM Pandemic Webinar, which is part of a series of webinars produced by the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine and the ACRM Technology Networking Group to help bring needed information to rehabilitation researchers and providers regarding the use of telehealth during the pandemic. Today's webinar was produced in collaboration with the Neurodegenerative Diseases Networking Group. Uh, my name is Dr. Mark Hirsch. I'm the chair of the ACRM Neurodegenerative Networking Group, and I'm very pleased that all of you are here today. Today's speaker and topic, the topic is applications for ambulatory activity monitoring in telerehabilitation, and will be presented by Dr. Ervin Van Wegen, Associate Professor, Department of Rehabilitation Medicine, Amsterdam University Medical Center in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Before we get started with the presentation, I do want to advise that this meeting is being recorded. I'd like to ask all attendees, please do keep your phones or mics muted. Keep your cameras turned off throughout the presentation. We do expect to have about 20 minutes available for discussion at the end of the webinar. So if you have questions, please type them in the chat feature, and we will address as many of those as we can during the later part of the hour. It is my distinguished pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Ervin A. H. Van Wegen. Dr. Van Wegen is Associate Professor at Rehabilitation Department of Amsterdam University Medical Center. He is co-responsible for strategy and policy with regard to the scientific research in the neural unit. His research focuses on the coordination of locomotion and standing balance, as well as rehabilitation and recovery of motor function in neurological disorders, including Parkinson's disease, stroke, and multiple sclerosis. Within current projects, Dr. Van Wegen acts as project coordinator and supervisor of PhD doctoral students whose projects are aimed at understanding early prognosis and longitudinal change in neuroplasticity and functional recovery after stroke, development of tele rehabilitation interventions and technology, self-management and ambulatory monitoring of physical activity and exercise in patients with stroke, PD, and MS. Dr. Van Wegen is an outstanding teacher. He teaches in the Faculty of Behavioral and Movement Sciences. He is also Director for Program Rehabilitation and Development of the Amsterdam Movement Sciences Research Institute. In addition, he's a member of the Organizing Committee for the International Conferences on Neurorehabilitation. I would also like to add that Dr. Van Wegen achieved international prominence through his authorship of the Rescue Trials, Research and Cueing in Parkinson's Disease. And his well-known work is published in the Journal of Neurology, Neurosurgery, and Psychiatry, as well as in the Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Dr. Van Wegen, we look forward to your talk and we'll now turn the presentation over to you. Thank you for being here today. Okay, Mark, um, thank you so much. Um, I'm hoping that everybody can hear me. My microphone is on. Um, so uh, thank you very much for the, for the kind introduction and uh, also thanks to ACRM for the, uh, for the invitation. Um, so my broader topic for tonight is on remote sensors and monitoring in neurodegenerative disease, but I will uh, pick a few topics uh, from my own work and work from others, mostly directed at Parkinson's disease, um, because that fits uh, largely with uh, the work that I'm doing at Amsterdam uh, University Medical Center. Um, I do somehow uh, need to uh, disclose that I uh, received grants from several um, international and international uh, granting agencies, um, and I have no financial uh, disclosures um, beyond that. So 
just to start off, when we're talking about applications for monitoring in uh, telerehabilitation using uh, sensors, um, my, it's also always my thought that you can divide those in three different categories. The first categories we, would be to use sensors for general activity monitoring, and then you're thinking about you know step counts, uh, which can be converted into energy expenditure, which can be used in research, mainly as descriptors or outcome measures. Um, there are some problems with this type of uh, general activity recording. For example, um, if, uh, if people start wearing these sensors, uh, you can have reactivity effects. And actually, we have noticed that these can go uh, both ways. These can, these can go in the direction of people um, actually becoming more active because they feel that they need to get a good recording. Um, and the opposite effect could occur when uh, it, the uh, the wearer perceives the system to be expensive and they don't want to break it by using it too often or uh, by moving around and then they start becoming less active um, and those could be uh, avoid avoidance effects of uh, you know actual maintaining the usual physical activity that we are that we are interested in so that's something that we need to uh, keep in mind the next category would be uh, something called delayed feedback in free living performance for example um, in uh, in uh, the usual wearables of uh, the Fitbit or the Nike Fuel Band or the Apple Watch, um, you can have daily activity and step counts, but they can be fed back to the user, for example, at the end of the day as a cumulative score um, in, in step counts or um, you know number number of uh, steps taken or distance walked, uh, uh, and sometimes they also record um, the number of uh, episodes that you ha have done cycling or stair walking, for example. So at the end of the day, you get a cumulative score, delayed feedback on free living performance. And then you can also use sensors in uh, telerehabilitation to give instantaneous or direct feedback on performance. And I have during my presentation uh, a few examples, and one of them is uh, on postural correction in Parkinson's disease from several studies, also from our own uh, group. Um, but also to uh, to uh, give information on the user on uh, walking and balance instability uh, during acti acti activities of daily living. And there may be uh, several other uh, examples, obviously, and I have a few examples at the end of my presentation, if time permits. So Mark Hirsch already introduced this uh, trial um, that we performed um, uh, quite a while ago, and it was published in 2006. And um, what not a lot of you, the younger people among you may not realize that um, you know, the, the development of technology of wearables is not that old. Um, using accelerometers to record physical activity um, has been around for a long time, but the, these were, um, you know, in the 2000s, these were still using wired uh, sensors connected to a battery pack with a little uh, recording computer. Um, and that's exactly what we did in this particular study, uh, which was back then cutting edge. So I want to take you through a little bit of the history of this, um, of this study. Um, it was a uh, home queuing program where we trained um, patients with Parkinson's disease uh, using uh, external rhythms and implement these strategies in their home living environment. So the physical therapist actually visited the patients at home um, and uh, taught them uh, different strategies based on these rhythmic external queuing uh, uh, techniques um, to improve uh, mobility. And we found some improvements in these different categories that are shown here on the screen, walking, uh, balance, uh, fear of falling, and fatigue. And um, we found those using standardized walking tests, for example, a 10-meter walking test. Uh, and we also uh, did a posture, took a posture and gait score, which is a compilation of several UPDRS um, subscores. Um, we timed balance using the time balance test, and also the posture and gait score obviously gives information on the on the posture and the posture and balance capability. Um, we had a self report on falls efficacy, uh, and we also measured uh, fatigue with a multidimensional fatigue inventory. And we found on standardized tests um, improvements after uh, a queuing intervention compared to a control situation where people did not get a queuing intervention but were placed on a waiting list. And this is just an example of what we found for the 10 meter walk test. This is gait speed. So on the X axis, you see the assessments uh, at 0, 3, 6, and 12 weeks. On the Y axis, you see the mean walking speed in meters per second. 
and for those people um, that are uh, that like to think in kilometers per hour, so one meter per second would be about 3.6 kilometers per hour. Um, and what you see here is uh, two separate lines uh, for two different groups. And the first group is the one that I show here that received between zero and three weeks uh, the cueing intervention by the physical therapist in the home situation for three weeks, three times a week. And what we see here is that compared to the control situation, which is the other line between zero and three weeks, they had a, an increase in walking speed. The late group, which is the bottom, uh, the bottom line, received in the second period, three to six weeks, a, um, an intervention. And you see the same increase um, as, in, as in the early group. So to us, this was an indication that compared to control situations, uh, the queuing intervention actually improved comfortable walking speed measured with the 10 meter walk test, which we performed uh, in the house. And uh, cumulatively, these uh, intervention effects are about 5.2 centimeters per second uh, comfortable gait speed. Now, obviously, if you do these tests, you basically, you're basically testing capacity. So you're testing whether a person uh, can walk 10 meters in a certain amount of time, and you ask them to do that at a comfortable speed. Um, but what you're really interested in is how the improvements in these standardized tests actually translate to actual physical activity in the natural home environment. That means, how does it relate to real-world performance? Um, and we did that by using, um, and now we could call it an ancient uh, system of activity monitoring, but I'd like to explain to you, um, you know, where we came from and how that translates into modern-day uh, wearables. And this is the uh, the title of the, the publication that if you want to look it up, look it up later. So um, we gave queuing training and we wanted to test whether this queuing training actually affected real life mobility um, in the absence of, a, of a, a tester or an observer by just uh, measuring physical activity with an activity monitoring. And this was the activity monitoring that we performed. As you can see in the picture, it was a wired system. Um, so the accelerometer was uh, placed on the chest uh, and on both legs, uh, on the upper legs, on the side in the sagittal plane. And it was connected to a little uh, data logger that was worn on the wrist. What you can do with this system is you can classify postures and motions. And these postures you can subdivide into standing, sitting and lying. And these motions you can divide into walking, stair walking, running, wheelchair driving and bicycling using um, advanced algorithms uh, based on the data that is being recorded by the sensors. And I will show you some examples of that later on, how that, how that works. Um, the particular system that we used was the VitaPort Activity Monitor. And it was a company for TAMEC Instruments from the Netherlands. And uh, actually this particular system was also brought into space by NASA. Um, so what we're doing is we're recording accelerations of the legs and the trunk uh, continuously over a certain period of time that the person is wearing it uh, on a uh, memory card in the computer uh, that's in that little pouch on the on the wrist or on the on the body. And what you see here is that um, you can classify these body movements in walking, sitting, standing, lying, as I said earlier. And um, the nice thing is that you can have the person wear it and the observer does not have to be present. And that's the same thing with uh, now the wearables that we have nowadays, obviously. Um, and back then what we did was we went to the patient's house, um, we applied the system and then uh, we, we took it, uh, we collected it uh, at the end of the day. So we did, a uh, we did a 12 hour data recording in this particular case. I'm going to take you through some advantages and disadvantages of the, this type of system. And um, these advantages and disadvantages may be a little bit different for the current day wearables that you can wear on the wrist or maybe you know, the, the activity monitors that you can wear on the ankle or on the, on the waist nowadays. So the advantage is that you can have good objective assessment of free living activity um, without any external influences. It's in the natural home environment. You have very little interference with performance um, because patients can basically go about their daily business and do all the daily activities that they usually do. You can do longer duration registrations with a very high resolution in these sensors. You can go up to a thousand hertz um, per second uh, data collection on the, on the signals. It's not space bound, so people don't have to come to a laboratory to do kinematic analysis. You don't need an observer. 
and it's relatively simple and cheap compared to uh, high-tech three-dimensional kinematic systems if you want to do kinematic analysis as well. And obviously nowadays we have uh, other methods with reduced sensors that can do with advanced algorithms um, very similar uh, analyses. There are also some disadvantages and this particular system and some of the wearables that we have nowadays uh, have the same problem is that you cannot shower or swim with this uh, with this system um, and the system that we use is relatively bulky if it's a watch then it's not uh, that problematic anymore but uh, for example Meg Roberts still has sensors that, is, that are max matchbox size um, that could be in the way of doing certain activities or uh, have problems wearing when you're wearing pants. The reactivity that we um, talked about earlier, increased activity to please the clinician or the researcher to have a good measurement or decreased activity to uh, try not to break the device or the sensors because uh, they may be expensive. Another advantage is that you have that you have no data if the system malfunctions and that's the case with any uh, wearable if the battery is dead uh, then you have no data so um, I always get a question um, in my in some of my lectures for why well why don't we ask people what they're doing um, why don't we just uh, do self-report uh, physical activity measurement because then you can just ask patients what they're doing or people what they're doing and then you can record how active they are uh, by just asking questions. Um, that is obviously uh, something that's being done very, very often. And um, this is a nice review that uh, for people that are interested in it's very, it's very good reading material. Um, they actually compared the use um, of physical activity questionnaires, self-report measures um, versus direct measurement using activity monitoring, uh, using uh, accelero sensors. And they found a huge list of self-reported physical activity questionnaires, uh, and this is not even all of it. So there are there are many many more. Um, so right away we are um, we are finding uh, one problem here is that uh, you know what questionnaire should we pick? Um, and there may be some questionnaires that are validated for your particular population, but some others may not be. Um, but there is a bigger problem. Uh, the choice of the questionnaire may not may be trivial, but this is a bigger problem. Um, they found that um, in the studies that they collected in this review, um, that sometimes uh, the physical activity questionnaires overestimate the actual performed activity, and sometimes they underestimate the actual performed activity. Um, and so that's a big disadvantage of using questionnaires because first of all you have to know whether it's an overestimation and you really want to know how much of an overestimation it, it would be if for some reason you cannot use uh, wearable sensors. And I think with current day technology the wearable sensors are so small that, uh, that it's probably a good idea to just have people wear, uh, wear a sensor and have a perfect objective measurement. And then if you want to be specific about what type of activities people are doing, you can add uh, a questionnaire on uh, what type of activities they actually were performing, because that's something that's still difficult to do with uh, activity monitoring sensors. I want to take you back a little bit into the, the technology of these particular accelero sensors on how do, how do, they, how do these sensors work? And typically what you uh, find in these uh, systems is the piezo-resistive acceler accelero sensors. And what that means is that they can measure accelerations down to zero meters per second squared. So uh, they don't have uh, a low cutoff. Uh, and it also means that they are DC coupled. So they can actually uh, measure position of the sensor with respect to gravity, as well as accelerations. And what you see here on the top right is uh, the internal workings of a uh, accelero sensor. And basically what you have here, it's a little mass sitting on a piezo-resistive substrate. And when the mass starts moving, the substrate starts moving. And uh, if you put a little current through it, the current starts oscillating. So if the mass starts oscillating, you have an oscillating current. And then you can convert that into an acceleration. Um, the other thing is that the mass, if you flip the sensor over, the mass is pulling on the substrate. And if you have it in the, the orientation that it is right now, it's actually pushing down on it. And in those two different situations, you have a different output of the piezo-resistive substrate. Um, so that's a big advantage of using these piezo-resistive accelero sensors because you can then um, derive the position of the limb or the body part that it's on 
and you can record the acceleration that these uh, that this body part is actually uh, going through. Typically, you have uh, uni or biaxial uh, accelero sensors. Uh, the uniaxial are uh, the ones that have one sensitive axis, and biaxial they have two sensitive axes, and basically they have two masses and two substrate uh, piezoresistive substrates in them for the biaxial ones. So how does the system that we used, uh, using these wired sensors on the body, classify the movements? Well, what you see here, and basically that's why I showed you how these internal, uh, how these sensors work internally. Um, you have basically a sensor on the chest and a sensor on the, the leg. And if both of the, orient the sensitive axes of the sensors point are pointing upwards, in this case, uh, on the chest and the leg are pointing upwards against gravity, um, you, can, you know that the person is lying because it has a certain output in a certain position. If the person is sitting up, the orientation of the red arrow on the trunk is changing from this direction upwards to forwards, and that's a different output on the sensor. Um, and then you know from the combination of the legs and the chest that the person is sitting. If the person then stands up, um, both of the sensitive axes are uh, perpendicular to gravity, um, and then you know that the person is standing. So just by looking at the orientation of these three, uh, of these two um, sensors on the legs and the chest, you know whether the person is sitting, standing, or lying. Now, if on top of that, the sensors start moving, um, you know that the person is uh, undertaking some kind of activity, in this case, walking. So then, you know, the sensors are moving uh, back and forth, and uh, the chest sensor is moving up and down. And basically what you get when you're walking, you're getting a, a signal that looks like this. And I will show you a, a blow up of that signal in the, in the next slide. Um, and this accelero signal is basically looks, looks like this. So every peak in this, in this signal is a heel strike. So when the person is putting their leg on the ground, uh, it's a, a quick change in acceleration and this uh, is converted into a peak into the signal. And if you have a high enough sample frequency, you can actually record this peak. And then you know that the person is walking. Um, and the motions that you see in the sensors are slightly different. Um, in the chest, obviously, uh, the chest sensor, you have a double frequency because you have the impact of both heel strikes in that signal. Uh, and that's what you see here. So if you look at, the, for example, one leg on the bottom, you have a peak which coincides with the peak in the chest. And then the other leg, is peaking here, it has a heel strike here, and that's also visible in the chest. So this is a very visual, uh, simple visual analysis of what these uh, signals do uh, under motion conditions. And this is a blow up of the uh, system that we use from TAMEC, the Viteport Activity Monitor. And basically what you see here is um, uh, the trunk three times because we have sensors in the forward, backward, left, right, and the up-down direction. And we have the le right leg and the left leg. And basically what you can do by just looking at the uh, signals here, you, can, you know that in this particular uh, instance, the person, oh, I don't know what I did. In this particular person uh, system, uh, the person is sitting because the system has an output of one. And that means that the uh, sensor is actually pointing uh, opposite to gravity. Um, and that means that the, the gravity is pulling on the, on the sensor and has an output of one. When the person is standing up, the orientation of that sensor changes and the output goes to zero. And that means that, you, that the person is standing. And when the person starts walking, the signal becomes a repetitive uh, heel strike signal, as I show here above. And then we know that the person, the person is walking. So just by looking at the time evolution of this line, we can actually determine what uh, the person is doing sitting, standing, or walking. Oh. And when you do this um, for Parkinson patients and uh, control subjects uh, during the course of the day, and you uh, calculate the uh, number of walking periods uh, longer than five seconds and longer than 10 seconds over a full day uh, of recording, what you see is that uh, typically Parkinson patients are less active across the day. Um, but there are also some overlapping periods. And the periods are typically in the morning, uh, at the beginning of the afternoon, and in the evening. Uh, and that, if you think about it, that makes sense because everybody in the morning has to get up, has to make breakfast, has to brush their teeth, 
uh, not in that order um, or you, you know you have to you have to get dressed um, you have to start get ready get ready for daily business and then you see that uh, the activity patterns start to diverge control subjects become more active and Parkinson patients become uh, less active again during the lunch time period uh, you see there you see a drop in uh, physical activity in both groups and they start coinciding everybody is probably do have has similar types of activities doing uh, going out to lunch and sitting down with uh, with people uh, for lunch and then in the evening at late later in the day you see the activity patterns diverge again so this is a very interesting way of just getting grip on activity patterns using this type of uh, uh, sensors uh, sensor setups now what we did was as i said earlier we had a uh, we had two groups in our intervention study an early intervention and a control situation where people were put on a waiting list and they after three weeks they crossed over and we had a late intervention group and the, the early intervention group changed into controls. What we did was before the intervention, we did a full day of recording. After three weeks, we did a full day of recording. After six weeks, we did a full day of recording. And six weeks again later, so after 12 weeks, we did another session of uh, monitoring uh, for a whole day. And um, basically what we did was um, we came to the um, person's house at the same day of the week about the same time of the day, we asked them to perform the same medication regimen, uh, and we instructed them uh, not to change their uh, physical activity patterns. We left them naive about the outcome variables. We did not tell them that we were looking at how active they would be, but that we were just looking at their bodily movements. Um, and um, we asked them um, you know, to avoid any co-interventions that may change mobility, for example, uh, doing something out of the ordinary because uh, you're wearing this particular system. Um, for example, in the, in, we, we did encounter some cases where people were actually afraid to break the system and just stayed in their chair all day. Um, and that was uh, something that uh, when we noticed that we had to do, uh, we had to redo the measurement, obviously. Okay, so how does that look, monitoring during a regular day? In the morning, um, we arrived uh, and applied the system, we left, and then the person goes about their daily business. They maybe start doing a little cycling round or walk the dog, uh, and then um, they start working, sitting down for a period of time. Sometimes they have leisure activities, and in the evening um, they have a cup of tea. So we don't actually know whether they are cycling in the mountains, but we can determine whether they're cycling. We don't know whether they're walking the dog with a loaf of bread under their arm, but we do know that they're walking. Here, we don't know whether they're reading a book, uh, sitting behind a computer, but we know that they're sitting. Uh, and here also sitting, and uh, here also sitting. We don't know whether they're on the phone, but we know that they are in a certain body position uh, with uh, very little activity. And then in the evening, we came back to the house and then um, we picked up the system. In this particular case, we did two patients per day. So uh, we went to the person's house early in the morning, applied the activity monitor, went to the second person's house, and then at the end of the day, we picked the systems up in the reverse order. This is how the assessment was done. It's quite uh, labor intensive for an assessor, but during the day, we don't have to be there while the system is still recording physical activity. Now, if you do this for a certain number of hours um, and you um, let the system calculate based on these categories that I showed you earlier and the, and the lines uh, of, of the physical activity monitor accelero sensors, you, you then can determine when the person was sitting, standing, walking, or even cycling. Um, and here you can read the footprint. Basically, what you uh, see is that a person cannot be standing and sitting at the same time. So the blue and the yellow have to be mutually exclusive. But a person uh, can be uh, walking and standing at the same time. Uh, and cycling is another category that here, for we don't know whether where the person was going, but they did it twice per day. So they went somewhere on the bicycle and then they came back uh, on the bicycle and they sat uh, in between. So you can add all these uh, all these lines up, and then you get um, based on the different variables that we uh, determined uh, on static activity, sitting, standing, lying, and dynamic activity, walking, cycling, and general movement. Uh, you get a certain number of variables uh, and basically the, the percent of total time from the recording that the person was doing these types of activities um, we were using as outcome measures. 
and then you get a kinematic report. And in this case, the one that I showed you earlier, um, we have 88% of uh, static activities, so sitting, standing, lying, and then 12% uh, of dynamic activities. And basically what you see here is uh, the subdivision of those tasks. And we know that we can see here in red that the person was walking about 7% of the total recording time. Now, if you do this before, after, uh, and uh, at the follow-up in the intervention, you get a similar graph that we found earlier with the 10 meter walk test, but now it is free living mobility, uh, the percentage of total walking time. And we see the same figure. So we have, on the x-axis, 0, 3, 6, and 12 weeks of assessment. Uh, on the y-axis, we have the percentage of total walking time. And basically what we see, the same diamond-shaped pattern. In the intervention phases, we see an increase in uh, percent walking time, while the control, uh, gro control group does not have an increase. And here in the uh, intervention phase, there is an increase compared to the situation where there was no intervention. Um, and if you extrapolate this to a full eight hour working day, um, we find that it's about 25 minutes extra walking time. And that's very important information because then we know that this queuing intervention actually also, besides influencing uh, fatigue, balance uh, and walking speed, it also influenced uh, the total number of walking time um, that, people are, uh, that people are performing in their free living environment. So that's an example of the first category that I uh, that I showed you earlier. And from this, we could then conclude that this particular rhythmic queuing program uh, not only increases walking speed, but also a free living walking activity, uh, amounting up to about 25 minutes of walking per day, which is significant, uh, a significant amount of extra time walking. Um, and these, these findings are very consistent with the improvements in the other outcomes uh, on gait related activities. The nice thing is that uh, with this particular type of system, you can also get uh, insight into the variations across the day. The two graphs that I showed you, you can see that in the middle of the day, there's a lot less activity than in the morning and in the afternoon. Um, and you could then start asking questions about, you know, are these pa patterns different for different types of um, uh, patient populations, for example. Okay, so this was an example of an early system uh, that was still wired um, and that had a limited memory capacity. And nowadays we have a lot of new wearable sensors that have uh, much more capabilities in terms of uh, battery life, but also in terms of memory. And what I wanna show you now is a study that was performed uh, by Shu et al. in 2014 they reviewed 76 studies and um, they were interested in what type of uh, sensing and feedback for gait analysis and intervention was, uh, was being used in the literature. And basically what they found was in these 76 uh, studies, they found uh, more than six types of uh, sensors um, with the biggest uh, proportion of sensors being the inertial measurement unit. And basically the accelero sensor that I showed you earlier is a form of uh, an inertial measurement unit. Um, they have goniometers, they have the accelerometer that is not DC coupled, uh, in this case, uh, has a certain proportion. Um, but the message that I wanna send you here for this particular slide is that uh, there are a lot of different types of sensors that are being used in the literature to, uh, to record um, free living activity. Um, and for example, a gyroscope uh, has different types of properties and it, it can, example, for example, give you orientations of, of limbs, which, um, which a regular inertial measurement unit uh, cannot give. So the message here is that there are a lot of different sensors and uh, the most used sensor is the inertial measurement unit. The second question that they asked, in what type of populations are these sensors being applied? And first and foremost, what you can see on the top here in the table is that uh, most of these sensors are being tested, have had been tested in healthy subjects. And then you have certain uh, subcategories of osteoarthritis, vestibular loss, Parkinson's disease, et cetera, where uh, these uh, sensors are also being, uh, being applied. And you have another category with uh, several studies looking at spinal cord injury and other central uh, nervous system lesions. 
So what are the applications that these sensors are being used? The first one is uh, just by, for sensing, for recording gate parameters. And then here, what you see in the picture is the number of studies that have used sensors on the trunk, the hip, the knee, and the ankle. And you can see that most of them are being used on the knee and on the trunk. And uh, for feedback on gate parameters, um, there's actually a lot less. Um, you have eight studies that, there were eight studies that used the trunk sensor to give feedback on gate parameters, uh, and some on the lower leg and the foot uh, and the knee. Uh, none on the hip and the pelvis or the thigh. So we're going to focus now on the feedback uh, sensors for uh, gate parameters. Uh, and um, I'll give you uh, some examples on uh, tr using trunk sensors to give feedback on, on gait and balance. And basically what, they, uh, what these studies did was uh, they, get, they gave feedback on trunk movements uh, with the aim to uh, reduce excessive trunk motions by reducing trunk sway, which you can measure with these sensors. Uh, and, and in that case, uh, reducing trunk sway would be an improvement in walking stability. And um, these trunk sensors measure in different types of uh, axes, mediolateral axis, the anterior posterior axis, or the inferior superior axis. And these are the studies that are actually reporting that. So if you're interested in um, what a, a particular study that wants to, uh, in that where you want to investigate uh, trunk motions around a certain axis, you can, you can go back to this review and see what, uh, what has been done on that already. This is a study that I'd like to mention because it's a, uh, an interesting study where you get feedback uh, on trunk sway and it's actually being fed back to the person by using a vibrating headband. So the sensor is uh, number one, it's detecting the sway of the trunk. And if the sway exceeds a certain uh, threshold, which, call, which is called the vibrotactile feedback, feedback threshold, you get, a, uh, you get a signal on the, on the wrist, on the headband, uh, which is directional. So if the sway is too forward left, forward backward, you get uh, a front back. Uh, vibration signal. If it's to the left and the right too much, you get a left and right uh, vibration signal. And um, patients were asked, people were asked to correct um, their trunk motion based on this feedback system. And what you saw here uh, is that there, uh, in the control group that didn't get that didn't get uh, feedback from the uh, from the vibrating sensor. Um, there is uh, there is no change in um, in in, uh, in in sway after training, and in the feedback group, you actually see a decrease in sway in most of the directions. Uh, this is the roll sway angle, which is uh, a, di a slightly different uh, direction, but this is the uh, the angular velocity, uh, the pitch sway angle, and the uh, the pitch sway angular velocity were all reduced in the feedback group. So this shows that you can use an accelerator sensor on the trunk. Or on the lower on the lower waist, um, and feedback the information directly to the person um, to correct uh, the that signal, um, which is a nice application of uh, using uh, sensors, I think. So I'm, I'm this is a uh, another review. Uh, it's called Technology Based Outcome Measures in Parkinson's Disease by uh, the group of SPE. Um, and I'm not going to go through all the uh, details of this particular table, but what I want to um, uh, what I want to show you is that um, these are these sensors are used for different clinical problems. For example, for improving the diagnosis, but also for improving re rehabilitation intervention. So you can use it for to diagnose what the what the problems are, and then um, also use sensors to implement uh, rehabilitation interventions. Um, and in the categories in the in the net in the next columns, uh, they actually explain what the available technologies are for that particular clinical problem and what the clinical objective is. So, um, just looking at the time, I'm not going to go into all of the subcategories, but uh, this is something that you may want to read um, at your leisure time. This is an example of a system. Um, from the same group, um, where they actually have um, ambient sensing in the house um, with a wear wearable system uh, with sensors on the neck, uh, the wrist, the arm, the hip, and the and the legs. And actually, these uh, the motions of these sensors are being recorded by an ambient sensor um, and a, a mobile phone. And these devices actually uh, transmit the information from the sensing system directly to a cloud-based server. 
And um, this information can then be accessed by uh, the family or a caregiver or by the clinician to see you know, what type of activities the person is doing and what type of... Um, um, oh, sorry, that's my phone. Een mogelijkheid in de klink deze goed. Sorry about that. Um, so this is a, a way that you can actually have people wear uh, remote sensing and then remotely uh, have other people um, analyze these signals while they don't have to be present. So this is uh, something that is uh, very much in development now. This is 2014, but now we're six years later. Uh, and there are many, many uh, examples of these cloud-based systems where uh, clinicians are getting very valuable information on uh, home-based um, movement patterns and uh, disease patterns in patients. Evan, this is Mark, about five minutes. Yes, okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll move on quickly, thank you. Um, the second category would be to, uh, so we had, an inf we had an example of this direct feedback um, already uh, with the trunk sensor from, uh, with the trunk sensor and the headband. Um, and there are some uh, systems with uh, where you have at the end of the day cumulative information giving delayed beat feedback on free living performance uh, in terms of step counts. Um, and the nice thing is that nowadays um, about at least in Europe 90% of the seniors between 50 and 65 have smartphones and these smartphones are all equipped with apps and uh, accelero sensors, sometimes even goniometers. Um, to do the same type of analysis that we uh, that we talked about earlier, and um, they can actually use it uh, by themselves to see how active they are, and uh, you know use it as a uh, um, as a way to motivate themselves to become more active. Um, these delayed feedback signal systems uh, are uh, this, these are some examples. For example, the Fox Insight wearables project. Um, where they received uh, a, a, a watch which is connected to an app and uh, the app is just uh, forwarding the data directly to a cloud-based server. Um, it's, in this case, it's a Pebble smartwatch. And um, this is now recording in thousands of patients' uh, activity patterns. And uh, you know, if, you, uh, if you have advanced algorithms and machine learning techniques, you can actually derive valuable information if you also know, for example, patients' uh, medication schedule. This is a system that I want to um, present to you that uh, we developed at Amsterdam UMC. It's, a, uh, it's called the Upright, and it's a device that is uh, specifically meant for posture correction in Parkinson's disease. And it's an uh, example of an instantaneous feedback system. It's, uh, it's about a matchbox size and people wear it on the chest. This is a prototype device that you see here on the left uh, with the large bands, but uh, basically what you could do is uh, if you wear a bra, you have it on a clip. But now we have a, a single chest strap, which is a little bit lower on the, on the rib cage. Basically, what the system does is uh, when it's placed on the stern, it measures the trunk angle uh, in the sagittal and the frontal plane. Uh, and uh, on the top right, you see an example. If the person is stooping forward too far, the sensor starts vibrating, giving a signal to the, to the person that's wearing it. Oh, pay attention. You have to stand up straight. Uh, and it's a very simple feedback system to, to correct uh, stooped posture in Parkinson's disease. Um, we have a publication on this, so if you want to read um, the results of that uh, in detail, I'm going to show you uh, one, one slide with the results. Um, but we basically wanted to test uh, you know, the effects of this, uh, this system and basically also the feasibility in 15 patients. And what we did was uh, we had them wear the system just uh, to record the, the motions of the body and the stooping of the posture without giving feedback uh, on, that, uh, on the posture. And then in the second week, uh, we put the posture correction on and asked the person to respond to the signal. Um, so these are, these are uh, the characteristics of the group. So we have 15, 15 patients, about 2.5 Hunyar stage um, and uh, medium advanced disease. And basically what we saw was uh, that uh, there was a decrease, significant decrease in the trunk angle uh, from the baseline period where there was no correction of the posture to the intervention period for, uh, with about uh, five degrees. 
And what we also saw was that uh, there was a correlation between the uh, initial trunk angle and the mean change. So people that have worse stoop posture were better able or they had a larger correction of their posture. Uh, and the same thing went for uh, the self-reported improvement. Um, people with uh, larger uh, trunk deviations uh, reported, uh, self-reported uh, more improvement in, in stoop posture. This is, if I'm looking at the time, uh, something that I'm going to um, skip. It's basically a, uh, a very comparable system to, uh, to the Accelero sensor that, that I explained earlier, um, but it's just miniaturized. So it's a, now a little device that you can wear uh, in your pants pocket and does basically the same thing. Um, and I basically want to end the presentation with something that I envision um, that incorporates basically all the different types of feedback uh, that I talked to you about in the, one, of the, uh, one of the first slides. So we have um, activity recording um, that can be analyzed offline. We have um, activity recording that has delayed feedback, for example, cumulative uh, at the end of the day, and we have instantaneous feedback. And all these types of uh, recordings are displayed in this particular graph. So in the center, we have the patient um, that is wearing a kind of activity tracker that records physical activity. We can give instantaneous feedback to the person about this physical activity to correct uh, posture, uh, trunk posture or trunk motion, as I, as I saw explained earlier. These, these uh, activities can be recorded at the end of the day and fed back to the person in a delayed feedback fashion so that they can uh, see how active they have been. Uh, and hopefully what you can then do is um, by using this, this, these type of feedback loops, you can change the person from being an inactive uh, patient to uh, you know, an active, an active uh, participant um, in, in social life again. So this is something that uh, we're uh, investigating in, uh, in some of our current studies uh, in the Netherlands. So I'm uh, closing uh, my presentation. Well, in the, I, I'm going to take one more minute to show you two more uh, interesting reviews, because obviously we talked about uh, physical activity recording and uh, monitoring with wearable sensors, but um, there are now also applications where you can use these wearables for, uh, for example, in this case, detection of uh, mild cognitive impairment. And um, this is a nice uh, current review from 2020 in the Journal of uh, Alzheimer's Disease, um, where in the home setting, you can use these types of accelero sensors uh, and also smartphones for early detection of mild cognitive impairment. Um, and you can do that by uh, combining information from self-report questionnaires uh, and these uh, activity trackers, for example. It's a nice read, and if you're interested in, uh, it's very much uh, uh, recommended by me. And um, last year, uh, at around this time in 2019, there was this working group that uh, had a uh, that presented a roadmap for the implementation of these digital outcome measures in Parkinson's disease using these mobile health technologies. And this is also an interesting read in the context of what I explained to you earlier in these deep, these three types of uh, feedback that you can uh, that you can use. And then my final five seconds I want to uh, use to um, pitch uh, the International Society of uh, Parkinsonism and Related Disorders World Congress in 2021. Um, in and this is in the Maastricht in the Netherlands, and uh, you know I'm very much excited that this uh, conference is coming to the Netherlands because it's uh, close to my home, and um, I, uh, you know, maybe I I will be able to uh, to uh, visit to see some of you uh, that have attended this seminar at that conference. And this concludes my uh, slide presentation, Mark. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. Thank you, Erwin. We have. Plenty of time for questions, and I see that there are two questions in the chat box. Uh, let me go. The first question is by Hannes Devos. Yeah. Uh, is one day of monitoring sufficient to estimate physical activity? How could one control for whether elements partic participant having a bad day, a work day, or the weekend? I think that's a great question. Yes, it is. 
and um, so we have we have obviously tested this um, in our um, in our in our populations, and I do I do agree with Hannes that the general rule is the more data the better. Obviously, you know if you want if you can record a full a full week of physical activity, you have you can basically average out some of these uh, bad days and some of these uh, patterns that are influenced by work days and weekends. Um, but in several studies, we have found that if you do 24-hour activity monitoring and even 12-hour um, uh, even activity monitoring during a working day, um, you, can, um, you can get quite reliable results. And um, what we found in our, in, the, in, the, in our rescue study, for example, uh, is that if you uh, do it in a standardized, standardized way, so um, if you do it on the same day of the week for all those four assessments, and if you do it uh, on the, um, uh, if you do it at the same same time of the day, so if you start the recording every time at eight o'clock in the morning, for example, or nine o'clock in the morning, um, then it's it's uh, it's it's quite reliable. Um, but obviously, um, there there are also some publications that state that uh, you know if you do uh, if you do seven day, you you basically are able to wash out any day-to-day -day variation if there's, you know, if it, if there's a storm uh, or a hurricane where people have to stay inside uh, and they become less active, which is which is basically a, a random event and it will probably not count for all of the subjects, but um, yeah, it, it, is, it is a concern. And, you know, if you have any suspicion that that is the case, then uh, you should probably, um, you know, correct somehow for that in your analysis. Good question, Hannes. I see another question. Okay, another question. One more question from the chat. Uh, yeah, from John. Let me see what I can get in there. Okay. Uh, John Morris asked, is it possible that over the longer term, individuals would become less responsive to instant feedback? And does delayed feedback require more engagement by the user, thereby promoting responsiveness? Yes, yeah, so um, that's that's a, again an interesting question. I'm not sure if I have a definitive answer. Um, I have not seen any uh, data or from my personal experience uh, regarding the first question whether people become less responsive to instant feedback. What what I need, need to uh, stress is that obviously the type of feedback and um, um, you know how often it is given or when it is given. So you, you, need, to, you need to have a system that is really uh, tuned into the movements of the person. For example, in the stooped posture situation, before we could apply this to the patients, um, we had to set a threshold. And if you, set, if you set the sensitivity too high, then the system uh, goes off too often. Uh, and it also goes off when it's not needed. For example, if you uh, if you pick up something uh, from the floor, then you also stoop forward, but then within five seconds you're back you're back up straight, and then the system does not does should not give a signal. So the tuning of the system is uh, is important. Um, and in our feasibility study, I did not get an, any indication that people were um, getting less sensitive to the signal. It's basically uh, very similar to uh, using queuing strategies, right? In in um, in in these po in these populations, and um, I also have not seen any uh, scientific uh, data that there's some kind of desensitization to to uh, these type of uh, these type of cues. Now, the second question from John, uh, where is it? Yeah, uh, does delayed feedback require more engagement by the user, thereby promoting responsiveness? I think that's one of the reasons why these uh, systems are so successful because you get uh, you, you can have some kind of um, uh, self motivation, right? You can see uh, what type of activity uh, you've been doing during a day, and then you can basically um, strike a deal with yourself about uh, either matching that the next day or uh, surpassing that the next day. Um, and if you have if you see that you have been uh, less active for a few days, then you can sort of motivate yourself to be become more active in the next period. Um, so I'm not sure if that is then um, more responsive than instantaneous feedback, but it, it is a way to, uh, yeah, to get cumulative information on your activity and use that to influence your subsequent behavior. Yes. 
Thank you. Do we have any other questions? We can also entertain questions uh, over the mic. Absolutely. Could you maybe say a few words about the MCI detection and um, the use of the IMUs? Yes, yeah, so um, I only came across this paper last week uh, when I was sort of preparing for this, uh, for this lecture. Um, let me see if I can get the slide back up uh, because I don't think you guys, you guys can see the slide, right? Could you, Correct. is it possible to share the screen again, Terry? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so this is, uh, now I have to move this aside. So basically what they find here is that um, um, it's, it's not using uh, one particular activity monitoring sensor, a wearable um, that can predict MCI but it's a combination of different types of uh, systems, uh, among which is uh, activity or vital, uh, vital system monitoring. And um, so basically what they're doing is they have, they're having people wear these devices and they're also asking them, for example, um, daily questions using ecological momentary assessment. Um, and they're using uh, short screening questions about uh, memory, cognition and things like that. And the combination of these, the information from the activity sensors uh, and this eco ecological momentary assessment, and in this case, analysis of, for example, speech patterns or sleeping patterns. Um, the combination of that, uh, you, can, you can put that into a prediction model. And uh, apparently using those, those types of systems, you can um, predict the occurrence of MCI better than by just using a, a neuropsychological investigation. That's the message of this uh, of this particular paper. It's a review, and um, it's about early detection of MCI. So, um, you know, by combining sensors, sensor information with uh, this, this, these other types of information, um, using you know a home based uh, in a home based setting, um, the idea is that you can you can do early detection of uh, of MCI. Thank you. Terry, would you mind putting the last slide up again, if that's okay? Which one, sorry? Um, Terry's going to, I, I was asking Terry whether she could put up the last slide. Yeah, I see some more questions, Mark. Oh, there are, okay. Uh, yeah. We've got two minutes left. Oh, I see a compliment from Hannes, which is much appreciated. Thank you, Hannes. Th thank you, Hannes. Um, I also see a question from Mariam. In the real world, we have no control over the dimensions and frequency of the obstacles. And as a result, the experiment would be unique to each participant. So the lack of knowledge about the experimental environment makes data analysis inaccurate. Um, so yes, uh, as I said earlier, so we have only limited amount of detail in uh, the types of activities that people are doing. So uh, with these, two sensors, one on the chest and one on the leg, you can sort of subdivide walking from sitting, lying, standing. Um, but obviously we don't actually know what they are doing uh, while they are walking. They could be talking to somebody else, they could be carrying a shopping bag or they could be walking the dog. Um, and uh, we also don't know whether they're uh, walking in the park, uh, you know, trying to circumvent trees and roots or whether they are walking on a, a smooth pavement. Um, so that definitely is a, is a limitation that you have to keep in mind in your um, in your analysis that this this type of uh, these type of systems cannot uh, in any way correct or yeah very accurately record that type of uh, that type of situation. So what you could do is um, you could augment the information from the activity trackers and the wearables with uh, asking questions, uh, for example, uh, using a diary. Thank you, Ervin. Thank you, Dr. Von Wegen, uh, for sharing your expertise. I really appreciate it. On behalf of ACRM, I would like to thank everyone for listening.
The recordings will be available in the next 24 to 48 hours, so please uh, do recommend uh, this webinar series to your colleagues. This concludes our episode for today. I would like to wish you to be safe. Stay healthy, everyone. We hope uh, to have you join us again at the next webinar. Thank you. Okay, and thanks everybody for uh, attending and for the compliments. And thank you, Mark, for, uh, <laughs> for helping me with this. <laughs>